Thanks for checking out this breakout today. I believe the conversation that we're gonna have in this moment is really important. I, I especially wanna say thank you to the lead pastors who are here and watching this online because ye, the change that needs to happen in our churches can't happen without you being on board. So thank you for, for being a part of that. Just so you know, my background, I was a youth pastor for 16 years before stepping into a network role with our youth ministries. And I've been doing that for the last three years. And so this conversation births out of my passion to reach this generation, as well as just an awareness of how rapidly things are changing in our culture. And so uh, that's, that's where I come from and why this conversation is such a big deal to me. For the last five years of my youth ministry life before stepping into the network, I got to, to work at Pasco Faith Assembly down in the Tri-Cities of Washington. And one of my uh, favorite things there was the incredible facility that we had as a tool. It's uh, a lot of acreage, a great building, and it's surrounded by this budding housing community. But it wasn't always that way. See, the reality is 40 years ago, a pastor and a church board with vision purchased a huge plot of acreage far outside of town for their then normally sized church. See, they had vision to see physically where their culture was growing and they set the future church up for success by getting ahead of it. Today, what I believe we're talking about is that same thing. The reality is the generation that we are discussing today by the year 2020, will represent 40% of the consumers in America. This is a huge opportunity. This is a huge uh, a group of people. And if we can learn how to do ministry so that Generation Z connects with the church, I believe we can set the future church up for some really prominent success. And so that's why I'm um, passionate about this. That's why it's so important to me and uh, hopefully important to you. Here's where we're at today in America. The baby boomers who were born between 46 and 63 represent about 23.5% of the U.S. population. Generation X represents 15% born between 1964 and 1979. Millennials represent 24.5% of the population born between 1980 and 1996. Generation Z is the largest generation in America today at 25.9% of the population. These Generation Z participants or, or members of that generation were born between 1997 and 2010. That means that I, as a 34-year-old male, am right at the median age of the population of the United States. Age 36 and down represents the majority of Americans, more than 50%. See, if you dig a little deeper, you find this in terms of culture, uh, it, it's kind of difficult to say that millennials and Generation Z are broken up in, in an accurate way generationally. The world changed so drastically between 1980 and 1996. I mean, think about the transitions that took place in that time. It's pretty unfair to, to loop that generation all into one category. So some, some people will break that up and say that from 1980 to 1989 is, is what they would call older millennials while 1990 to 2000 is what they would call um, younger millennials. And then Generation Z would become 2001 to 2010. So watch what's happening in our culture. Boomers, the, the one generation represented 17 years of, of people being born. The Xers represent 15 years. The older millennials would represent about 10 years. Younger millennials would represent another 10 years. And Generation Z represents nine years of people being born. That's how rapidly culture is changing and to the point that some are literally saying that Generation Z is named so appropriately because they'll be the last generation that we can identify that culture will change so rapidly that we won't be able to put our thumb on cultural realities in a generational mindset, but it'll literally change every two to three years. Generations are, are almost becoming obsolete. So we're not talking about a generation that is emerging on the scene. They're already here. James Emery White says this, that they are not influencing culture. They are culture. Hold this up against the fact that most of our churches are still wrestling with how to appropriately hand off a church culture from boomers to Xers and maybe even considering millennials. And you realize we have a crisis on our hands. 
culture has, has leaped past the church. And my suggestion is this, and I say this as an older millennial, skip the Xers and skip the millennials and pay attention to Generation Z. Here's why. Because not only the sheer size of this generation, but the fact that this generation is the first generation to have influence on older generations at the rate that they do as well as they have the ability to connect the values of older generations in their own value system. So let's go to this. Who is Generation Z? We already talked about this. They're born between 2001 and 2010, which means that today they're between 8 and 17 years old. They've never known a world without an iPod. They've always related to the events of 9-11 through the history books. They may struggle to tell you who was the president before Obama, Among those who have never been alive in their lifetime are Princess Diana, the notorious B.I.G., Joe DiMaggio, uh, John John F. Kennedy Jr., and Walter Payton. Beloit College uh, on the East Coast says this. They they release a list every year of the mindset of the incoming freshman class. And so they they release that this year about the class that will be 2022, which are freshmen this year. And uh, this is what they say to help prepare for this culture of students. They say students heading into their first year of college this year are most likely 18 and were born in the year 1999. Their classmates could include Eddie Murphy's Zola and and Mel Gibson's Tommy, their kids. They're the first generation whom a phone has primarily been a video game, a direction finder, an electronic telegraph, and a research library. Electronic signatures have always been as legally binding as pen on paper in their lifetime. In college, they'll often think of themselves as consumers who have borrowed a lot of money to be there. Peanuts comic strips have always been repeats. The Panama Canal has always belonged to Panama and Macau has always been a part of China. It's doubtful they've ever used the high-pitched whine of a di- or ever used or heard the high-pitched whine of a dial-up modem. Donald Trump has always been a politician and a Democrat, an independent, and now a Republican. Amazon has always been a preferred method of consumerism. In their lifetimes, a Blackberry has gone from being a wild fruit to being a communication device, back to being a wild fruit. They've always uh, been on the search for Pokemon. The Concord has always been permanently grounded. When they entered school, laptops were already outselling desktops. As toddlers, they may have dined on some of the uh, over the lasting over canned food from a Y2K case. Whatever subject, there's always been a blog. The U.S. Supreme Court decisions have always been available on its website. One out of every four Major League Baseball players have always been born outside the United States. This is a different generation. This is a a, a new culture. And my hope today is this, is that we would start a conversation We don't have all of the information and statistics we need to know everything we need to know about Generation Z. And honestly, the the things that the church needs to do to respond to Generation Z haven't even been thought of yet. But we have to start a conversation uh, about several of the realities as well as what are some of the possibilities for the gospel to intersect Generation Z. Here's what I'm going to ask you today as we have this conversation. One, don't dismiss the findings on Generation Z because you know a student who doesn't live up to it. The reality is there's culture variance, but the students that most of us know would represent the outliers, not the norm, right? They're the exception, not the norm. And so don't dismiss. And then the second one is don't determine. We're going to talk about a lot of characteristics of Generation Z. And it's important for us not to get so hung up on whether those are good things or bad things but just to understand them as realities that the church has an opportunity to respond to. Obviously, some of them, like our moral compass, is going to help us understand we don't agree with that. But the point is not whether it's good or bad, but what do we do in response to it? Over the last uh, 200 years in America, there's been three distinct ages. The first one was the agricultural age, where people were clustered together in small communities, And you were known for who you were, right? Your last name was really important. Whose son are you? Who's your cousins? Which which farm or which area do you come from? School often doubled as church on Sunday. And and pastors were probably the smartest people that you knew. In the industrial age, things transitioned. The populations moved towards the factories. 
you became known not for who you were, but for what you did, right? What, what role do you play in the factory? What industry are you, in, are you in? And what role do you play in that industry? The smartest person you knew in the industrial age was probably your boss. The information age is the age that we currently are in. And it's one where where you live is largely irrelevant, even though people are still clustering in our urban centers and the, they're growing by percentages. The smartest person you know is probably the person who has the most access to information. And you're not known for who you are. You're not known for what you do, but you're known for what you think. Think about that for a minute. Politicians and everybody, it's not what family you came from or whatever. It's the stance that you take and what you think about the world that we live in. With this shift, has really come a shift in the value systems of our ages. Terry Parkman is a youth pastor at River Valley Church in Minnesota. He's done a lot of research, and I think this is super helpful for us. He's identified some of the value shift that's happened in these ages. Check this out. The industrial age values were production, performance, and quantity. What can you make? How well does it work? Or how well does your factory or your part of the factory work? And how many of these can you put in the hands of consumers? Think about it for a minute. How much does your church culture still resonate with these values? Production, performance, quantity. The, the values of the information age are a little different though. They, they are access, engagement, and community. How much access do we have to the personalities and the information that you're sharing with us? How much engagement, right? These students are, uh, these, this generation is no longer a generation of consumers. They're a generation of publishers. What that means is that they don't buy the things that other people create. They look to create the things that other people will engage with. Everything is open source, right? That's the, some of the value of this generation is we're not necessarily going to consume. But the question is, can you make me care about what you've created? And then think about this community. In a, in a culture that they have access to everyone, one of the big questions they ask is, who's real and who can I be real with? Right? And so these, these values have shifted. And here's how big of a deal this is. History will tell us that there are major revolutions every time there's a revolution in language. There was a major revolution when language was first communicated, when it began to be spoken. There was a major revolution when language started to be written and shared through writing so the person didn't even necessarily have to be there. There was a major revolution when, the mass, when mass printing became a reality. Ask any church historian and they'll tell you how much our church culture today has been shaped by the occurrence of the printing press. The reality is we are in a new era. We are in a new revolution of language and that's because language has become digital. The value, and, and this is why it's such a big deal, I would say even a bigger deal than the printing press, because digital language translates to cultures overnight. Digital language translates to, to new languages and new people groups. It lets the entire world, really we're living in what will become a global generation, the first global generation since the Tower of Babel. That's what is happening in our world today. So we have an opportunity. We have looked at some of the values and realities, but how has this shaped Generation Z? How has this played out in their everyday life? I want to identify uh, a quick number of realities for this generation and then what I think we can do about it. First is this, they are religiously unaffiliated. Get this, belief on God is up. Statistically, belief in God is, is on the rise, but it's belief in a general God. And the felt need for the church is almost none. Because this generation has been taught anything I need on this, I can find online. The, uh, this is a, a generation in America that sees themselves as founders who intend to build a better society. Just a number of weeks ago, we saw the, the march on Washington, D.C. as students responded to the shootings that had happened in Florida. And for the first time, the people on the microphone weren't politicians. They, there were some celebrities, but the bulk of them weren't even celebrities. They were everyday students who see themselves as founders, people who are moving the society towards a better norm. They are the, a, a naturally multicultural society. They view immigration as a norm. norm. As a matter of fact, get this, the most common name in the United States, the most common last name is no longer Smith. 
The most common last name in the United States as of a couple years ago is Rodriguez. Let's be honest, how many of us can even spell that? <laughs> but culture is changing under our feet. One of the realities that Generation Z faces is that childhood is disappearing. James Emery White is an author who said this, that students are growing older, younger. This is happening because the line between adult content and child appropriate content has virtually disappeared. Students have unlimited and unfiltered access to everything. Right? I remember being a kid and watching the 6 o'clock news and having them say, at 11 o'clock, we're going to cover this. It might be better if your kids are in bed. I literally remember hearing those words over the TV screen. That doesn't exist anymore because people aren't getting their news from the 6 o'clock news anymore. But everything is online for everyone to see. There's not even a necessary line of professional journalism. Margaret Mead is a cultural anthropologist who said this. Throughout history, most culture has been disfigurative where parents and grandparents help younger to understand failure. A few times it's become co-figurative, where change happens so fast that society depends on young to help understand, depends on the young to help understand the future. I anticipate that a time is coming in history where technology changes so fast that culture, for the first time in human history, will be pre-figurative, where the children will have to figure out for themselves what their values will be. Margaret Mead said that in 1950, and it's happening in front of our eyes today. One of the things that's led to a reality for Generation Z is they're a highly pornographic culture. The access to everything has made it so that the average age of exposure to pornography is now seven and is constantly growing younger. Children are actively practicing with each other what they've seen, and they believe it to be normal. Most see no moral dilemma with pornography, even if it's personal, meaning that you know the person that you're looking at. The, one of the realities of this is this generation is now sexually fluid. While the church is having a conversation, what do we do about gender identity and sexual identity and, and orientation and all this? How do we grapple with that? The generation is, this generation is already moving on to see gender identity and sexual orientation as irrelevant. The, the question will no longer be, are you heterosexual, are you homosexual, are you LGBTQT+, they won't identify as any of it because it'll change so rapidly in their own personal lives. They view technology differently. This is a huge aspect of Generation Z. Technology is no longer a toy, it drives life. In a survey, 92% of Generation Z said they would rather lose their dominant hand than their access to technology, but bec because they believe that it is that instrumental in their future. They believe this about their lives. The most commonly asked birthday gift for a nine-year-old boy last year was this, a YouTube channel. They see themselves as creators and as publishers, where my generation took in the X Games. We wanted to watch someone do something that we couldn't do. Generation Z wants to do something that everyone else can do, but do it in a way that gets everyone's attention. They want to publish, they want to create. As I said before, they're the first global generation. What's here today will be viewed in Indonesia tomorrow. And what they watched in J Japan yesterday, our students are watching today. Information is traveling at the speed of light. They're the first generation, and this might be the most important thing for us, most important thing, period. This generation is the first generation in America to be decidedly post-Christian. That means this, that they have no memory of the gospel. They have no understanding of the gospel. But here's the thing, before you retreat, in lament at these realities, you have to remember that they are the product of a culture that we created. This is a generation that we built. And it's just a, uh, an ongoing continuation of the culture that we have lived in for years. Here's the one of the opportunities, or here's one of the realities that I think we have to wrestle with today. It's what James Emery White calls the squishy center. It's a theory that I, I believe is true that says this, about 25% of Americans are um, devoutly religious. Still true today as it was 50 years ago. There's another 25% on the far left that is devoutly secular. They, they are committed to a belief system that makes them secular. But in between, there's a 50% that we would call the squishy center. The squishy center 
is a group of people whose values will be determined by what is most commonly acceptable in culture today. Which is why 50 years ago, if you asked someone in the Squishy Center, are you a Christian? They would have said, yeah, I'm a Christian. Because it was the most commonly accepted value of the day. But that same person with largely a, a similar life might today be asked, are you a Christian? And they would say, no, because it's the most commonly accepted cultural value of our day. See, one of the questions we have to ask is, if this is true about Generation Z, if they're decidedly post-Christian, how do we do evangelism? One of the, the ways to look at it would be to consider this. On a scale of one to 10, everybody sits. Everybody who's not a Christian yet. One would be someone who is uh, made the decision they're against Christianity. They, they do not value Christianity. They have no desire to become a Christian. At 10 is someone who has just said yes to Jesus. They've accepted his invitation to salvation. They've accepted his invitation to new life, and they're starting a spiritual journey. 50 years ago, most Christians on the, or most uh, Americans on this scale would have probably been somewhere around an eight. Right? And so that informed how we did evangelism. We would go door to door. We would host special services or have a crusade in a stadium or under a tent because all we had to do was to get someone from an eight to a 10. We just had to get them to make that simple jump because these people already knew the narrative of scripture. They, they already understood probably who Jesus was, who David and Goliath were, who Mary and the wise men were, and maybe even the Apostle Paul. They, they understood, and most importantly, they understood Christian values. They were already built in, and they valued those same things. They just hadn't trusted Jesus with their life yet. So these crusades would happen, and we'd watch people march forward, and we'd go door to door and hand out tracts, and we'd get people just to jump from an eight to a ten. Well, the reality in America today is this. Most people aren't an eight. They're probably more realistically a two, maybe a three. They're not decidedly against Christianity, but they're far from saying yes to Jesus. So the, the idea that we're going to have a single conversation with an unbeliever and get them from a two to a ten is, is way outside the norm. Like that is, that is not our everyday reality. So here's my question for you pastors and, and church leaders. What is the place for someone in your church who needs to go from a two to a five? What's the place for someone in your church who needs to go from a six to an eight? Before they make this decision, how do they get on that journey? So what do we do? What do we do about this? I got to wrap this up. Here's the first thing. This is the first thing we have to do. We have to start talking about this. We have to admit that these realities are in play, and this is the culture that we have been asked to influence with the gospel of Christ. The reality is culture's changed. In many ways, the, the church has changed, and we need to address that change on purpose. I introduced Terry Parkman a little while ago. He was uh, teaching some of this same content and these ideas of Generation Z in, in the Asia Pacific. And he, as he was teaching it, he watched the reactions of people around the room from different countries in different areas of the, of the Pacific. One guy caught his attention. He was from Japan, and he was literally in tears as he heard the content. Afterward, Terry went up to him and said, what's going on? Why, you know, how is this impacting you? And the guy told him in tears, you know, 10 years ago, we were having this conversation with the church leaders in Japan, and they made the decision that this generation needed to catch up with them and needed to value the way they did church and that they didn't need to change, but this generation just had to fit in. At that point in time, 10 years ago in Japan, there were about 30 students in the average church. Today, there's 0.7. The reality is we will lose a generation if we don't shift the values of our church culture to match. Now, understand, I'm not saying that, that church culture is shaped by outward culture, but that really the, this second point would become our reality. We have to become and to train our churches to be cultural missionaries. In our own culture at home, Ed Stetzer describes, describes missional churches this way. If they do what missionaries do, they study the language, they become part of the culture and proclaim the good news, they be the presence of Christ and contextualize the biblical life and church for that culture. These are missional churches. That's who we have to be. We have to find the intersections between the gospel and the culture today. Three more points, and they're this. 
you can leverage science and the natural world because this generation is intrigued. We have more information than ever, and the beauty is science is continually pointing us back to God. One of the most brilliant physicists of the last generation, Stephen Hawking, who recently passed away, said this, it would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have begun in just this way, except as the act of a God who intended to create beings like us. That's someone who's leading a generation and opening the door to point back to God. Two more things. The first, this, the first of these last two is this. We have to make a commitment to grow young. If you don't set your sights as a church leader on bringing in a young generation into your church community, we will miss an opportunity and we will commit ourselves to a road of a slow and painful death. I'm not just being an alarmist. We've watched it happen in other church cultures and we have to address this today. The good news is that this generation is not about the lights and the camera and the production and and doing things that churches can't do. These values are really values that we can embrace in our church culture, values of access, of engagement, and of community. The last thing is this, empower personal invitation because it'll bring people to your church. Don't create things and then pressure your church people into using them to invite people. Ask your church community what they would actually use and create that. We have to empower personal invitation because generalized invitation to church will work less and less as this generation progresses. But they're listening to their peers. They're listening to their neighbors. You can see how these things will impact Generation Z, but how they also relate to millennials, to Xers, and even to boomers. Because for the first time, Generation Z is changing the culture for everyone even older than them. Some books I'd encourage you to check out as we wrap up. Meet Generation Z by James Emery White is a phenomenal read. I've gleaned a lot of this information from there, but there's so much more to dive into. I'd encourage you to check it out. Also, Growing Young by Kara Powell and some of her associates is a phenomenal book as you continue the conversation. Thanks for being here today. Have a great day. Thank you.